church but a buddy doesn't have a problem like that but I do okay. oh my fingers are nervous
I don't have time to maintain these regrets because I think about the way he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves. Us. Oh, how he loves. Yeah, he loves. You're just getting a little bit too nosy is what's going on. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know if you uh, ever take the time to stop and look around at what God's doing in our church and how many people he's using. Uh, this morning my heart has been touched because um, we have seen Justin grow from a little boy into a man. And it's not been easy for him. His daddies have been here in the church. That's the daddies he's had. And you men have done a good job with him. Every one of you that's had a piece or a part in his life he is what he is today because you cared. Brother Gary, your grandbabies are going to be who they are because you care enough to share with them. People look around you and see what God's doing and get involved. Get involved in helping someone that needs you. Some of these kids need your help. Some of us older ones need your help. A kind word, a hug, letting them know that you love them. Sometimes it's more important than any physical thing you could give them, such as money. Share with them what God has given you and be there for them. Even if they don't deserve it, be there for them. When I'm broken from the battle, and I've lost enough 
the realms Satan whispers to my troubled mind Just lay your armor down Where are those you loved and trusted Look around you there all gone Who would be easy to surrender when you're standing all alone And then I bow my head in silence as I pause received a visitor's packet and in that packet's a card if you've got that filled out would you kindly just hold it up and someone near you will bring that to me so that we can recognize your visit with us anyone all right well glad to have you with us once again then this morning in the house of God I uh, want to share with you a couple of um, I guess brief announcements I would say to you in your bulletin you'll notice that on Labor Day that September what is that, the 2nd or 3rd? 2nd of September. Yeah, down at the bottom of the announcements, there's a family fun day, Monday, September the 2nd, 3 p.m. at the church. Uh, 10 o'clock, I should say, till 3 p.m. at the church is going to be a family fun day. Uh, see Sister Charlene, it's going to be, uh, we're going to bring our food together and put it all together and have just a, a day at the church of uh, some fun. They told me there was going to be some, um, like a slip and slide for the... They say for the kids, but I don't know. I don't know if they know what that means. So, uh, exactly. Uh, so, uh, you know, come prepared to get wet and get dried off and that type of stuff. So, 
And then the other thing I wanted to share with you was the yard sale uh, totals came out to be uh, almost $3,400 in proceeds. Um, we expect that that money won't get cold before we spend it on something in the new church. I can promise you that. Uh, which, by the way, is progressing pretty good. We're, uh, we're moving every day. Uh, folks ask me all the time when we're going to get in. I'm still saying the first of the year. I'm still saying January. So uh, we're pressing for that, and we're still believing God. It's going to take miracles along the way, but thank God that's just exactly what he deals in is miracles. So I'm just counting on God to be himself, and I'll do all I can, and the rest is up to him. Amen? So uh, tonight I want, uh, tonight, this morning I want to ask you, if you will, please, to turn with me to the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, the book of Daniel, chapter number 5, and then I'm going to ask you to find the book of Romans and put your finger there because we'll be moving there a little bit later also. But Daniel, chapter number 5, I want to just take one verse out of this passage of Scripture that has a very, um, you know, I thought it was a familiar story, and yet I'm not sure many people know about it as I thought. So I'm going to share with you a little bit about the events of this particular passage. Uh, but we're looking primarily at verse number 27. Uh, before we read that passage, I want to share with you a little bit of the story of how this came to be. Uh, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, his name is Belshazzar. He is uh, the king of the province of Babylon. And he uh, rules over the greatest kingdom in the world maybe at the time. And, um, and he's, um, he's a young guy. Uh, you know, you got you got to just got really have to have a lot of, uh, I guess, uh, respect it is for for the youth as they grow up and take on responsibility. Because I got to tell you that when you're young, you make all kind of mistakes. Woo, son! And you usually get into positions and you take on more than what you can chew. You can't swallow it. I mean, you just chew and it gets bigger in your mouth. And 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 Belshazzar came out kind of that same way. I mean, he. He came into his grandfather's kingdom. Now, Nebuchadnezzar built a very grand kingdom. In fact, the grandest kingdom in all the world. In fact, it was, uh, it was illustrated to him in a dream by God that his kingdom was likened unto a head of fine gold. And all the other kingdoms that would come after him would be inferior to that. And so uh, Nebuchadnezzar's grand kingdom. And now his grandson comes along and Belshazzar, just a young man, takes over and he's ruling this incredible kingdom and, and the power and the majesty of the position that he's in and the kingdom that he rules over is just, uh, just so much that, I mean, he, you can't hardly imagine, maybe you can't imagine what a young man would do with that kind of money and power and freedom. And that's exactly what Belshazzar does. So the next, next thing we recognize is that Belshazzar comes in and he believes he's just all of this, you know, in a, as we said, a bag of chips on the side. He's, he's, just, he's just made himself. He's a self-made man, and, and uh, he's greater than God, even God. And, and so what he does is he's having this drunken feast where he invites a thousand of his uh, most closest associates to come and to be at this feast, and he, he then sends to, the, um, to, to get the, um, uh, the articles, the uh, vessels, that's what I'm trying to think of, the, the, the gold and the silver vessels that were taken uh, from the uh, temple at Jerusalem in the, in the siege of it, bring those dedicated holy vessels in, and him and his friends are going to drink out of them and get drunk. And so he's going to do that uh, as a kind of a statement that he's even greater than the God of the Jews. That's a problem. So he, 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 he does this, and at this feast, uh, they're all drinking out of these vessels, these cups, um, and, um, and in the midst of their party, an uninvited guest shows up. As they're getting well intoxicated, Belshazzar looks over and he sees a portion of a hand that comes, these fingers that come out of nowhere seemingly and begin to write into the pilaster of the wall. And they write these words, um, many, many tekel euphorces. And, 
he doesn't understand it, but he does know one thing, that he suddenly is no longer drunk. And the Bible says, in fact, that his, it's a funny statement, I didn't look at the verse, maybe you guys have already seen it, where it talks about his joints becoming loose, his knees was knocking together. Uh, when he saw that happen, he began to tremble, and uh, he, he was just, he was, which one? Verse 6. Uh, in verse 6, yeah, Brother, Brother Jim, thank you very much, uh, says to us, then, then the king's countenance was changed. That means he sobered up. And his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his loins were loosed. And his knees smote together, once again, one against another. Uh, that sounds very familiar to me. I've been that scared. I have been that scared before. In fact, every time I almost step on a snake, that's what happens to me. It's amazing. I mean, I can't hardly get around good. I'm getting so old sometimes. But I can almost step on a snake, and it's amazing how high I can jump, how fast I can run, how loud I can scream like a girl. And, I mean, I, I'm just telling you, the youth seems to come back. But, uh, and, and I noticed that all, all the trembling in my, in my body. And, uh, but Bel, Belshazzar uh, began to be concerned about what he had saw. Now, he had no idea what the writing on the wall meant, uh, but it ended up being that God had told him um, uh, through interpretation. He went and um, his, his mama uh, tells him she remembers a guy that knows the interpretation of things, and so calls Daniel forward, and Daniel gives the interpretation and says that... Um, uh, and uh, I guess we skip down and we can read that. I was only going to read the one verse, but verse 26 says the interpretation is this. Um, uh, many means God has numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel means thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. And Euphrates is that thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And uh, that was the interpretation of it. So Belshazzar hears from David. I'm Daniel, I'm sorry. Here's from Daniel, the interpretation of what God had wrote on the wall. The hand, if you've ever heard the uh, expression that the handwriting's on the wall, that's what it's talking about. It means that judgment has come. It means judgment day is here, and, uh, and, you, and anybody could, should be able to see uh, that. Now, like I said, he didn't know what it was. He didn't know what specifically detailed it was, but he knew it was judgment. He knew it went too far. And I'm going to talk to you about that today, and it's in particular, verse number 27, that says, Thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. Now, uh, with, with Belshazzar, um, he, he has a wonderful opportunity to meet one of the most godly men in all of Scripture, and that is Daniel. Now, Daniel had lived in the time of, of uh, once again, of, of the grandfather Nebuchadnezzar uh, as a younger man. And uh, he was found to be full of the Holy Ghost, a man that whom God showed favor to, a man who, in fact, Nebuchadnezzar and everyone else that ever met him said that there's an excellent spirit in him. I mean, he's, he's just a, he, he's a man, uh, he's a godly man of character. And there's something about this Daniel. And the something about Daniel that was so special was that the, the God of heaven uh, resided in his heart and, and he served the God of heaven without any apology. So whenever uh, Belshazzar calls Daniel in to, to give the interpretation, it's only after he's already tried to get the interpretation off the wall from his own magicians and, and own astrologers. He's asking them, what does it mean? And they can't answer him. They don't know. And so uh, when he calls Daniel in, Daniel comes in, and this is what the king says. He says, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll hang a gold chain around your neck. I'll give you a, 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 a solid gold uh, necklace to wear. I'll make you the third ruler in the kingdom. And I read that. I thought, well, that must mean after him and his mama. I don't know. But anyway, he, he, I'll make you the third ruler in the kingdom. I'll give you a gold chain around your neck. And I'll make a proclamation of all your authority in this kingdom. And Daniel is now about probably close to 90 years old, I guess. He's an old man by now. He's already come through Nebuchadnezzar. He came through, remember, 
his friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who went through the fiery furnace under Nebuchadnezzar. He come through that period. Um, he hasn't even, you know, he's, he's come now to be under this uh, Belshazzar guy. And, um, and, and as he's living his life and serving God in the government that doesn't seem to recognize God, He's called upon to make this translation or interpretation of the writing on the wall. And this is what Daniel says to that to the king. He says, I'll tell you what, you keep your money or give it to somebody else. I'll give you the interpretation, but I don't need any reward from you whatsoever. You can give it to somebody else if you want to. And then he turns around and says to the king, he doesn't do it disrespectfully, but he just tells him. I believe one of the reasons is because he, two, two reasons maybe. Uh, well, number one, things of this world really don't matter to him. And second of all, he recognizes and knows the king doesn't have much of a kingdom left when he reads uh, the writing on the wall. And so he, he shares with him, hey, listen, God's done tried you. He's weighed you in the balances. You are not, uh, your days are numbered and your kingdom's divided and going to be given to the Medes and the Persians. And when he tells him that, of course, um, he, uh, Belshazzar goes ahead and rewards him anyway. Uh, but I got to tell you that that very night, that very night, the prophecy came true. That that night, the uh, King Darius, or Darius as you may pronounce it, came in, uh, the leader of the, of the Medes, the king of the Medes, him and his army, and uh, uh, the and, uh, important, I guess, companionship with the Persians, came and overthrew um, the government, and, uh, and he, was, he was killed that very night Belshazzar was, and the kingdom was taken from him and divided between the Medes and the Persians. And Darius became the new leader of that province in the very evening that he received the prophecy written on the wall. Now, with all that being said, I want you to hear what I have to say to you today. Daniel chapter 5, verse 27 God said in that prophecy, part of what was written on the wall, thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. Very curious statement. God is telling him that I have judged you already and you come up short. I actually titled this message, I have to put a title on it for the guys and, and because they put it on the internet and make copies and stuff. I actually titled it Lightweight or Lightweighted. Uh, he says, uh, you've been weighed in the balances and you've come up short. You're not, you're not what you're proposed to be. You're not what you present yourself to be. It's as though you are fool's gold. You, per, you pretend that you're something that you're not. Uh, you look like solid gold bars, but you're hollow. Uh, the weight doesn't sustain the proclamation. You say one thing, but the, the following up or the following through with it doesn't come. And so you have been found wanting. You believe yourself to be as great as God, yet you don't have the ability to back that up. Let me take you to the three things I want you to know that he got charged with. In verse number 22, in verse number 22, Belshazzar got charged because he did not humble his heart. It, uh, David had went through the whole proclamation of telling Belshazzar, said, listen, your grandpa, your grandpa thought he was a pretty great man too and thought he had built the kingdom up. In fact, his heart had become so prideful, I don't know if you guys remember this or not, but he had, he had walked into his palace one day, Nebuchadnezzar had, and he had looked around and he said, look at this great kingdom I have built. He said, I'm the greatest in all the earth. There's nobody like me. There's not been nobody like me before or after. He said, I'm the greatest of all. And he looked around like that and he said that, that I'm the one that's done this. I've done this with my own hands. And God spoke a, a prophecy to him that he would, um, he would become, he would lose his mind. He would become like an animal of the field that the dew would fall on his body. His hair would grow like feathers or like the fur of an animal. His nails would grow out like claws, and he would eat grass like an ox. That's what happened to him. That's the judgment that came on him. 
And, and, and after this judgment had came on him and he had been in this condition, you know, he'd, he'd, he'd lost it. As they say nowadays, his cheese had slid off his cracker. After he came to himself, after he had uh, spent many days in this condition and come to himself, the first thing we find Nebuchadnezzar does is he, he immediately proclaims there is a God, and it is the God of Daniel. And in fact, if I could take you to verse... If anybody hears bells... I'm sure it's not nothing. It's verse 20, 37, yeah, in, in chapter number 4. Is that where you were headed? In, in chapter 4 and verse 37, Nebuchadnezzar, when he come out of his, uh, his insanity, he said, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways, judgment, and those that walk in pride... What did he say about them? He is able to obey. That was a public proclamation made by Belshazzar's grandfather, King Nebuchadnezzar. And so whenever Daniel comes in to give the prophecy of the handwriting on the wall, he tells Belshazzar, you know better. You know better. You know what your grandfather went through. And he recounts it again to him. And he says, this is what he did. And he says, one of the problems that you have is you chose not to humble your heart before God because in verse 22 he says, even though you knew it, even though you knew that God is the one that raises up rulers and tears down those that he chooses, you chose not to honor God. I'm bringing this to you today because I want to stop right now and I want to quit talking so much about Belshazzar and I want to talk about you and me. I've met so many self-made people in my life. Folks that think they earned it their own selves. Brought themselves up by their own bootstraps, I believe we put in the bulletin this week. People that think that, uh, uh, that, that they're better than somebody else because they've earned their way or they worked for it or they somehow have taken care of their stuff or they somehow apprise themselves as having arrived. And you say, well, Brother Buddy, surely there's something to be said about good hard work. Absolutely. I think everybody ought to do it. But let me tell you something. It's the God of heaven that gives and it's the God of heaven that takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And you can't base what somebody has or somebody doesn't have on their spiritual prowess whatsoever or their worth as an individual. Amen right there. And I, I, I find that what we are looking at here is the semblance of a man who is empty, who is on the outside pretending himself to be something that he cannot carry the weight of on the inside. God help us to have real, honest, sincere, true individuals that are through and through, amen? The same on the inside they are on the outside. I'm talking about folks that don't, are not putting up pretenses and hiding something on the... I'm talking about folks who are walking in a circumspect way and it's all the way through. I'm not talking about people that are pretending one thing and doing something else or are something else on the other side or on the inside. He humbled not his heart even though he knew. He was prideful even though Belshazzar knew that he had not built that kingdom. His grandfather had built that kingdom. And he knew even his grandfather had not built that kingdom, but that God had built that kingdom. And, uh, and he had learned that lesson, and he knew all about that, yet he chose not to humble himself. Let me tell you why is because we're in a day and an age, we are in such a nature where the Bible says that men have grown to worship and serve the creature more than the Creator. Amen? They love their own pleasures, and they, they esteem themselves higher than the one that made them. Somehow or another, it's got to where people think that we have traded places with God, and that He serves us instead of us serving Him. 
Belshazzar had not humbled his heart, and that's what Daniel told him. He said, Daniel, I love Daniel's fright, straightforwardness. He says, you knew all this, but you didn't humble your heart before God. And the second thing he accuses him of or charges him with is in verse number 23. In the beginning of that verse, he says, but instead what you did was lifted up yourself against the Lord God of heaven. Not only do people start out being uh, unyielded toward God, but if you continue to be resistant, and I'm talking to you today, you come at service after service or week after week and you just kind of resist whatever it is God's doing, you can start out just being unyielded, but I'm going to tell you where you're going to end up. You're going to end up being actually antagonistic or aggressive against God. Listen, this is what it is. Belshazzar had started out just being, just being kind of... Um, um, benign to God. He wasn't either for him or against him. Well, Jesus said, if you're not for me, you're against me. And so he thought he could kind of straddle the fence, if you will, and, and not be committed either way. And there's a lot, so many church people today that are, are sitting on the fence and not being totally committed one way or another. It's not even funny. The majority of the congregation anymore is not committed people. They are not commi- They should be committed. I mean, I'm not going to mean that part. I mean, but they're not. And they're not. Co- they're non-committal. They. They. They're just one foot in and half halfway out the door. I mean, and bless God, you. You feel like you're on the verge of uh, losing them every time the uh, something happens if the air conditioning ain't perfect or something, and, and just non-committal. The folks that aren't have any devotion to God or to His church whatsoever, just riding the fence. And, and Belshazzar is a, is a guy that he's, he, he starts out just being kind of uh, resistant to God, but he goes beyond that eventually and becomes aggressive toward God. And I'm telling you, if you keep sitting on that old split rail, one of these days you're not just going to be resistant to God, you're going to be re- aggressive against God. You're going to turn and be the enemy of God. The hedges and the highways are full of them today. Of ones that were in, rode the rail too long, caught a splinter somehow, and are now unable to be reached by any type of ministry whatsoever. Turned their hearts against God. Belshazzar set himself against God. Jesus warned against that. Jesus said, a man cannot serve two masters. A lot of folks do that. They're still holding on to the world with one hand and trying to hold on to God with the other. Yeah, amen. Uh, You can do that only so long. Eventually, you're going to have to do exactly what Jesus said. You're going to have to choose to love one and hate the other. You hear what that talks about? You're going to end up being aggressive against one. And that's what happened. See, Belshazzar started out just riding the fence, but then he got to where he got to think himself someone, and through conviction, he moved to a place he actually became the enemy of God, aggressive toward him. And then number three, the charge against him, also found in verse number 23, that instead of giving glory to God, notice what it says. Uh, We already told you he lifted up himself against the Lord God of heaven, and then... Uh, they uh, they brought the vessels from the house of the Lord and they drank out of them. And, uh, and notice uh, right halfway through the verse it says, And thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold, of brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know. And the God in whose hand thy breath is, and who are whose are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified. You've boasted about the gold and the silver and the buildings and the, and the timbers and the, and the peoples and the, uh, the animals and the property. You've boasted about all that stuff and you've raised that up and praised that as being your God and the one that holds your very next breath in his hand. The one that knows your tomorrow and holds your future, you have not acknowledged or honored. 
You say, Brother Buddy, I don't sound like there's much you get in that. I'm going to tell you, these are the charges that Daniel said was brought against Belshazzar to such a point that God himself wrote his judgment with his finger on the wall of his palace. Pretty serious. Most people have gotten today, or a lot of people, I wouldn't say most, a lot of people have gotten today where they esteem power and riches as gods. And they act like they attain them all on their own. When we know that it's God that gives men strength to gather riches. Amen. Moving on just a little bit further now, Belshazzar's judgment. We talked about the charges brought against him. Here's the judgments. The judgments found in verse 27. He says, you're weighing the balances and found wanting. Verse 27, that was the one I went to. You're lightweight. You're just fool's gold. You're weighed in the balances. You're not what you think you are. The Bible tells us in the, uh, the book of Romans that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. You're just not what you pretend to be. Number two, he says your days are numbered and they're up, by the way. I want you to understand something. You can't keep going the way you are. Listen to me for a second. I want you to understand this might be your last opportunity. You can't, they, they had, that, Belshazzar was a young man, and he brought all his friends together. He had a thousand people at this feast. Tell me they wasn't having themselves a time. They thought it was going to, man, this, this is the greatest time of our lives. We're going to partay. That ends in an A. They, they, they believed that uh, life could get no better than this. None of them suspected this was the end. It was it. God said, my spirit shall not always strive with man. And there comes a time that you're going to run out of the time of grace. There's going to come a time that God will no longer uh, uh, smile or wink, as the Bible says, at, at, your, at your calamity, at your, at your rejection of him, at your wickedness. There will come a time when, when your continual rejection of him will come to the very last straw. There's coming a time, listen to me for a second. They, man, they was blasted. I mean, things were well. He wasn't expecting an invasion that night. They, was, they, wasn't, they wasn't getting the army together and preparing them, making sure everything was sharp and loaded and all. They were partying. Nobody thought the kingdom was about to fall and he was going to die. Life is good. I'll keep going the way I am because I'm in control. God says... Oh, no, you're not. He writes in his own handwriting, the judgment time has come. Now, there's something peculiar I want you to see here for a second. I, don't get mad at me. Just listen to me for a second because we'll give an invitation after this service. But I'm going to tell you something. There was no invitation given on that wall. There was no invite to come and repent. There was no instruction to fall on your knees and get it straight. You know why? He done pushed that away. Time and time and time again. Now listen to me. I know God is love. Listen to me. But God's also a righteous and a wrathful and a vengeful God. He's a holy God. Some folks don't like talking like that, but it's the truth. Listen to me. He'll be your Savior today, but he'll be your judge tomorrow. Some folks say that no, God don't throw nobody into hell. They send themselves there. Let me tell you what the Bible says in the book of the Revelation. They were all cast into the lake of fire. And they say nobody jumped in. They're cast into the lake of fire. Yeah, God's a God of love. If you know him as, as your father, if you accept that, and, and then he'll pour out his love and his mercy on you. You reject that, and you will see the wrath of God. 
Belshazzar had pushed him away and Belshazzar had minimized him so much and, and actually had ridiculed him in front of his friends by bringing in the vessels of the temple of the house of God and defacing them and defaming them in front of everybody by drinking alcohol and getting drunk in their orgy in front of everybody as if to say, see, that God can't do nothing about this. I'm greater than Jehovah God. God said, we'll see about that. And God says, all right, you want something to show your friends? Check this out. And the Bible says his joints turned loose in his lower part of his body till his knees were banging together. What? And he says, I might have messed up right there. And when Daniel comes in, Daniel says, <coughs> you know, you're offering me to be the third ruler of the kingdom and a big chain of gold and a proclamation of my authority, I don't think I'm going to have time to use any of that. You can just give that to somebody else. Because what I read on this wall says it's done for you. Your days are numbered, and it's over for you. You've been weighed in the balances, and you've been found lacking or wanting. And God this day has divided your kingdom He's given half to the Medes and half to the Persians. And it's all done for you. And as Belshazzar's listening, he might have been waiting for the moment whenever Daniel would turn to him and say, now will you repent and pray and maybe God would spare you? And there was, that never came. It never came because the time of repentance had passed. Let me just try to wrap her up here today. Listen to me for a second. You can hear the message, and you can roll it off and go about and be your own man, your own woman for the rest of your days if you want to. And I don't know how many that may be, but I can tell you that they are numbered. <laughs> and the same one that wrote on that wall is the same one who is in judgment over your life. One of these days, there's going to come a time when there'll be no more invitation for you. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the time of acceptance or the accepted time. Now is the time that you move. When God's calling today, you can't push him off and then think that you'll set the appointment. Because it's not you that determines the time of your salvation. It's God. You don't get to make that choice. You push him off and you push him off. You keep on going about your way. Now listen, on the outside you look good. You've declared to everybody, yes I have and this is who I am. But when you put in the balances, you're found lightweighted. God knows what's in you or not. You're put in the balances and you're found wanting. Now listen to me for a second. You might think, well, Brother Bay, that's a great message. Listen to me for a second. This ain't a message to a congregation. This is a warning to an individual. You. You. You need to forget about every other person sitting in this place today. You need to think about just you. Just you. It's just you and God. Now listen to me. Because if you roll that off, it don't matter about the other hundred and something that's in here. It's only going to matter about you if you happen to walk out that door and meet God. You understand what I'm saying? It's only between you and him. This come a time when God's speaking directly to Belshazzar and said, this is what I've judged on you. And God's not calling you to repentance at that point. God's saying, here's what's going to happen because of your rejection Oh, I'd hate to have been in those sandals. No wonder his knees were knocking. No wonder he was scared to death. Oh, his life had now just totally turned 180. One minute he's, he's being worshipped practically by all of his friends and his comrades that are there. A thousand people, the Bible said. So much so that they bring in the vessels from the house of the Lord. And they deface them and defame them. Uh, he, he doesn't have any fear of anybody. He, don't, he ain't even scared of God. Man, this guy's awesome. 
And then the next minute, everything changes. He wished he could wipe out, erase what he had done, cleanse the vessels, undo the deed. But do you know you can't back up and erase it? You can't take it back once it's done. You can't, you can't cleanse yourself, purify yourself. He finds himself in a position now that he must answer for his sin. And this is where I want to lead you today. Come, Rick. I want to ask you today, listen, are you ready to meet your God? Belshazzar didn't plan it. He didn't know this was meet God day. You don't know it either. I'm asking you a simple question. Are you ready to meet him? If Belshazzar would have known, I, I, I guarantee you he'd have liked to have just one more day to straighten it out if he could. One more invitation is all he wanted. If God would have just sent him one more invitation, do you think he would have changed his ways? Oh, yeah. We see it worked with Nebuchadnezzar. Remember, God had to speak to him pretty sternly. He's the one that ended up being like an animal. Remember? Lost his mind. Ate the grass in the fields. Everybody made fun of him. He had just totally lost all of his, his honor and his glory, and he was humbled down to become like a brute beast. And then when God brought his mind back to him, the first thing Nebuchadnezzar said, Oh, man. I'm so glad he gave me another chance to the very first thing he does as ruler of the kingdom. It says, I make a decree. There is no God like the God of Daniel. He's the God of heaven and earth, and in his hands is everything, and he, he makes it all, and he makes that declaration. He had a chance. Belshazzar didn't get another chance. And I don't know about you. I don't know if you're on your last chance or you're next to your last chance, but I do know this. You never know. You never know. And you can only come when God calls. Belshazzar tried to push his limit, his, the, the, the line, I guess, beyond the limit. So I bring to you verse 26. Nope, 27 is what I want. Out of chapter 5, in verse number 27, this is what I want you to remember. Thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. Can you bring that back up again? That's the one I want you to go away with. Just leave it there. Don't even let it go nowhere. Keep it through the invitation up there the whole time because I want you to know that. You're weighed in the balances. You... God knows you on the inside, through and through. He knows everything about you. If that hits home with you and you know that you've been found to be empty and void in the judgment of God, the rest is up to you. Will today be the day of your salvation? Will now be your accepted time? I'd like to ask you to bow your heads right where you are for a minute and close your eyes before you stand, before we sing, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. I want to ask you a couple of questions. I'm not, asking you to, I'm not going to ask you to commit or move. I just want to ask you to think about a couple of things for just a minute. Just think about for a couple, couple minutes a thing or two that I want to share with you. With your eyes closed, please, and your heads bowed. Not looking at one another, certainly not talking to each other. All the texting has to stop. Listen for just a moment. Do you believe that there is a God who rules over heaven and earth and knows everything, even about you? If that's true, would you raise your hand right where you are, please? Okay, thank you. You may put your hands down. Secondly, Do you feel as though that God has spoken to you today and says, I have weighed you in the balance and you've come up lightweight?
God has weighed you in the back. God has spoken to your heart and says, you're not what you pretend to be in front of these people. Now listen, I'm not going to embarrass you. Everybody's heads bowed and eyes closed. Nobody looking but me. I just want you to be honest with yourself for just one time. If God has spoken that to you, would you just slightly raise your hand? You ain't got to put it up high. I just want to see it. Thank you. you can thank you. I see those two hands. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Anybody else? Thank you. I saw that hand. Somebody else? That you, you just not what you pretend to be in front of people. And God has said to you, I know you. I know the secrets. I know all the secrets. Anybody else real quick? and Because I'm going to pray for you special. I'm going to pray for you special. I want to make sure that I have the opportunity in my mind to picture you before God in a special prayer as I pray. Anybody else? Thank you. You may put your hand down. I knew there was at least one more. Is there any others? We're fixing to close it. Thank you. You may put your hand down. Anybody that wants, Pastor, I want you to pray for me because I'm not what I, I'm not everything I always purport to be either. Anybody? All right. Listen. Would you stand with me now? Brother Rick began to sing a song. I'm going to pray for you at the end of this service, those of you that raised your hand, but I would rather that you right now come and deal with God concerning that. It's real important that you know that the business has to be done with God. The invitation is today. God bless you. Somebody pray with that young man right there. This young lady coming right here and this young lady here. Somebody pray. Sweetheart, can you help me out here, please? Got some right down here. I surrender all. Hallelujah. I surrender all. I wouldn't put off till tomorrow when you might not have it tomorrow. Amen. Thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. <laughs> that ought to be enough. Empty and pretending? That's the judgment he had against Belshazzar. Is that what he's called in your life also? Don't push it beyond the limit. You have to come when God calls. Hallelujah. Oh, I surrender I had just one more chance. That's the prayer of every man, woman, boy, and girl that's in hell today. If they could just have one more invitation at an old-fashioned altar, they'd get it right, I guarantee you. If they could have one more chance. Don't send away your day of grace. Would you come? Don't keep pushing God away. Well, I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all, all to Jesus, I surrender Lord, I give myself to Thee. Fill me with Thy love and power. Let Thy blessings fall on me. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee. Just the chorus ring. Well, I surrender all. Here it is. This is the one. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all.
your heads bowed right where you are. When, just be aware, I'm not going to dismiss you with this prayer. This is the prayer I promised earlier. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you that I saw some movement today from some who were willing to admit, God, that you had spoke to them. There were some that did not yield or move, even though they had acknowledged that you had spoke to them, and yet still others that wouldn't even acknowledge that you had talked to them today. But Lord, my prayer is for mercy and grace upon the lives of each one in this congregation today. The scriptures are never contradictory, and you said that you're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And this would be in absolute perfect harmony with the fact that you are still calling lost souls today. Sometimes you've called them for the fourth or the fifth or the fiftieth time You've dealt with them over and over and over and over again. So it's very consistent with the fact that you're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But Lord, you also tell us that you'll not always strive with the spirit of a man, the reluctance and the rebellion of man, that one day, Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that one day every individual will have to stand in judgment before the Almighty God to give account for the deeds done in the flesh. That everybody one day must have a reckoning, a payday before an Almighty God. That day for many may come sooner than for others. Lord, my heart, my heart is extended in love to each and every one that may be opposing themselves today, standing in their own way. Lord, they may be hindering themselves. Lord, I pray, God, that you would tenderize their hearts. Lord, that you would lead them unto repentance. Trusting the Almighty God. Lord, I got a lot of believers in here. I believe that with all my heart. There's a lot of believers in this congregation today. Say amen if you're here with me. Amen. Every one of these believers today, God, are praying with me today. Right now, I need your prayers, guys, to join with me as we ask God to deal with every lost soul in our midst. God, please deal with every lost soul in our midst. God, we don't want any to die and go into perdition or into hell. Lord, we don't want anyone to miss heaven and miss the relationship with the Holy God. God, we beseech you, Lord, please move in their lives. Soften their hearts. Help their will to be crushed so that they may receive. Lord, we agree in one accord as we call upon you on behalf of these who may not can pray for themselves today. We'll glorify you as we see the answer of prayer. Lord, I ask you now to keep us. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you remain where you are for just a minute? Tell me what happened. I just prayed for you to come to my heart and read it.
I love you, brother. Amen. Love you, darling. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, I, I'm going to let you guys go, um, Brother Darrell. Amen. Amen. It's good to see you guys back. I'm sorry for all that you've had to go through so recently. It's been a lot for us, I know. Um, in dismissal, um, I just want to remind you, so many people find themselves in the balances already, and the judgment of God has failed that they have been found wanting. Sometimes they don't even know that. Most of the times they do, and they've rejected it, pushed it away. I ask God to burden our hearts for those that are lost and are persisting in that position. That God would help us to reach them somehow. Because some of them are your family. Amen? Some of them are my family. We love them in one way or another in, from some position or, or perspective. And we ask that God would send. Oh, God would send a missionary. God would send an evangelist, a messenger that would speak into their lives, that would change their hearts when they would receive the truth. That God would keep us on our knees till we see our, our loved ones born again. I'm going to close with that prayer. Father, I ask you now that you'd help us. Lord, we... We have a sense in this congregation this morning that it's not long before Jesus returns in the clouds of glory. We believe that one day and one day very soon, it might not be a handwriting on the wall, but it's going to be a, a trumpet in the clouds. And, and Lord, uh, uh, you as you come and there's a shout and, uh, and uh, the, in a moment and a twinkling of an eye, the believers changed and called up to be with you. Uh, that... That's not going to be another invitation. That's going to be, unfortunately, too late for so many people that have pushed you away just one time too many, just like with Belshazzar. No more opportunity. Lord, I, our hearts are burdened over that. Yeah, we want to go to heaven. We want to see you, but God, we don't want our loved ones to miss heaven and make hell. We want them to go with us. But God, that's not happening right now. They're not yielding. They're not giving in. Lord, they're, they're stubborn in their ways and they're locked in to thinking that they have it all figured out. God, we oh, help us to pray more and more that you would intervene in their lives so that we might see them come to know you as personal Savior. Lord, as we go from this place, I pray that that will be our heart's desire, our mission in life, to see souls come to you. Now, Lord, we ask that you'd be with us as we go from this place of worship, remembering that, uh, that you have indeed have weighed us in the balance. We give you glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.